Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 325. Although, perhaps instead of saying welcome to the podcast, like I do every episode, I should just say, get in the ring, Mick Wall. <laughs> well, Hi, Brandon. I mean, this is a pleasure. Honestly, it's kind of a, an honor. I know some people, you know, you're a controversial character in the GNR world as he sips some tea. Uh, but it honestly, as somebody who grew up as just a Guns N' Roses fan, never dreamed of being in radio, never thought of being, uh, you know, doing Guns N' Roses podcast, watching you on all the VH1 behind the musics and reading your book books. Uh, it's just been, it's cool to, to talk to you one-on-one. So just thanks for oh, your time. Sure. First and foremost. Well, listen, I'm glad to be here, Brandon. Ask me anything you like. See, I, I love that. So when I, I announced, I'll get a couple things out of the way because for the, believe it or not, I have. Fans just like you who have been following my works for a while. And so right away, a rebel uh, hippie from Sweden, he writes, when I announced you coming on, it's like, didn't Mick Wall block you on Twitter? And we can get into, we'll get into that because you gave. No, no, I I saw that. I saw that. Um, Did I block you on Twitter? I think what happened was, I mean, this was my old Twitter when that was eventually suspended by Guns N' Roses trolls which I was w- worried that would happen to you as well. I, yeah, oh, I it, may, it may have done because I'm now permanently banned from Twitter. <laughs> um, but I think that's because I keep calling the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson a cunt. <laughs> um, so, so they suspended me a couple of times and then finally they banned me. But Brandon, I am back. I am back. What's your new um, Twitter? What's your new Twitter then before we forget? Uh, at Mick black wall so it's like at mick wall but with black in the middle okay um that's because uh black is my family name on my father's side oh okay Um, it's a long story i I come from a long line of bastards (laughs) literally who were all night who had their mother's name oh man but if you go back to my grandfather his name was black yeah richard black so mick black wall Right on. No hyphens, nothing. Just at Mick Blackwall. I gotcha. Because I think your old Twitter, at Wall Mick, this was the mm-hmm. beginning of my podcast. You know, I never expected, you know, like, to, again, to talk to you, Mick Wall, or get other guests I've had on, you know, Matt Sorum or, uh, you know, Alice Cooper. I mean, I never th- imagined this. So at the beginning, you know, I'm getting people on who are attain- obtainable. And I had this uh, journalist on uh, by the name of Art Ivana. And he was entertaining. You know, there was some off the air stuff that rubbed me the wrong way. So I don't really talk with him anymore. But I'm wondering, because he used to at you all the time. And we can oh. start right here. Uh, that's what the kids call it, adding on, on, on Twitter, saying that he was the one that broke the news that Stephen Adler had a bad back at the Troubadour show. And that you, on Sarah's, you, you took the claim for that. You know, for that, and I at the I time I was like, I, for it. "What? Like I broke the news?" Yeah, he's like, he wasn't. I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm paraphrasing. A, you know, an old conversation, but it was like I was at the Troubadour. I saw Stephen there. I reported it. Then all of a sudden, Mick Wall was sort of reporting it as his own, and I was just like, "Yeah, okay." And he would tweet at me, tweet well, at you. Uh, two, two, two things there, Brandon. Huh? I have absolutely no recollection of that. But what I can tell you is that I don't recall writing a single word on Guns N' Roses for any magazine or anything like that at that time. I was uh, putting together the book that became Last of the Giants. And um, it may, if, if that's in the book, definitely, definitely. But uh, my books don't claim to only carry stories that I discovered personally, it's news. I mean, at the end of the day, the first person that ever reported on war breaking out in Europe, you know, um, it's news. So other people are going to write about it as well and talk about it. It's just news. Number two, I have no idea who this guy is. I don't even recognize his name. Uh, He's a music journalist. Who does he who does he write for? No one now. I mean, he came out also with the Guns N' Roses book, which I did not read. Oh, uh, what was that called? Uh, 
goodbye, Guns N' Roses. You're, you're welcome <laughs> for, for the, for the uh, free plug art. Uh, but moving on. Well, okay. well, listen, 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 listen. Right. If I had, if I um, had read his stuff, A, I wouldn't have known it because I don't know the name. But Stephen Hurt and his back, Alan Niven was telling me about that. Doug Goldstein was telling me about that. Slash told me about that. I'm still in touch with Stephen. I saw st just before the pandemic was the last time I saw Stephen. Um, but even if that information had originally came from that guy, so what? I mean, so fucking what? Stephen Hurt is back. Is it a, it, only this guy can ever mention it because he was there that night. What about all the other people that were there? You're right. I, I, don't really, I don't really understand what the point is. The guy sounds like a fucking idiot. <laughs> oh, and by the way, by the way, just for the record, I will block, ban, give the finger to anybody I want. Um, <laughs> Any time I want, just as they have the same privilege to do that too. Sure. Um, I, just, I just, I can't be. I'm good. Uh, I understand. So I'm just saying at the time, because they're, they're with Guns N' Roses fans, I know it. Even though my, my listener base is pretty nice, you know, I try to cultivate, you know, good people. Uh, but yeah, I can only imagine, like, I can't be thinking, like, oh, I got to block this one person. I was probably maybe among the mass blocks. So just wanted to get that out of the way that, you know, welcome to the show. I, there's no animosity there for those who remember that, you know. And I even said, I'm like, Mick probably doesn't even know me. I just think that's funny because I, I don't. Uh, uh, Brandon, i got to tell you, yeah. I have no recollection. I have no yeah. recollection. Oh, yeah, we spent too much time on this. It's, but yeah. what's, what's interesting, and we can also get this out of the way, another, cause this, I guess, is just a blanket thing and kind of along the same lines. Uh, this is a, a mention on on fa one of my comments on Facebook when I again when I announced that you were coming on, and and forgive me Caesar you have like five names I can only pronounce one of them so I'm just gonna call you Caesar. Uh, he goes, dude, this is a serious request. Mixed books have a lot of mistakes, mm -hmm. a lot. They are as basic as locations that anyone who's lived in LA can immediately know are wrong. Confuses names and locations. Some of his uh, tells, uh, tales, I guess, seem very confused or make no sense at all. Can you ask him how he does, how he checks all the facts that he writes about? Uh, as soon as you figure out that there is an inconsistent information being, being said, uh, you cannot take all of that. Uh, you're reading as, seri as serious. You're not, everything you're reading. You know, is not I, I read that. So yeah, yeah. here's the deal. Here's the deal. I lived in Los Angeles right through that period. Um, Unless this guy can give us examples, I don't know what to say. Uh, I wouldn't deliberately use a wrong street or venue or whatever. Um, the books themselves are rigor rigorously fact-checked um, by two different editors. They then go to lawyers who have to check that everything is bulletproof in terms of uh, staying on the right side of legality. Um, all that said, and, and I'm a book guy, far more than music, I'm books. There is not a book that's ever been written um, that doesn't have mistakes. But when I was the editor on Classic Rock magazine, I remember and this would happen all the time because you're writing about history and everybody remembers it differently. That's what makes it interesting. Mm. Um, but for most people, it's one story or one moment, like your guy at the Troubadour show and Stephen Hurt is back or whatever it was. Um, that's what they really, really know about. And no one else can really ever tell them anything about that, that they will feel shows more understanding than they have. And that's probably right. TV documentaries, the ones I enjoy the least are the ones where I really know, really know the story. The ones where I don't really know the story. I really like those because I don't know the story and it's interesting. When you know the story, when you feel you really know the inside of it, it's very hard to uh, think anybody might be able to tell you something you don't know. But here's the deal. I remember once we did a thing in Classic Rock 
and somebody wrote in in green ink the some show we'd said had happened you know on a on a on a tuesday in 1970 i think you'll find it was a thursday huh. and it's like okay okay you got me S so what what is it i mean really what's your point um my books aren't about it is and whether it was tuesday or fucking thursday they're not fan books they're not collections of fun facts and uh they're not meant to be objective they're none of those things they are literature and this is a lot of rock fans with my books because they are not interested in literature they are fans of a band and they uh, may well know more about their favourite band than I do, but I will know a shit ton more about every other band in the world than they will ever live to know. And I'm an authority. So the whole idea is, is that I'm a historian. I'm, a, I'm an authority. I read an Amazon review once of my Metallica book, and it said, it's just this guy's opinion. And I was like, yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. That's right. It's called a book. It's called a critical literature piece of biography. And of course, you want to get everything as right as you possibly can. And I don't think for one minute I've made so many mistakes that I'm no longer credible as a writer. Mm. Because I've been a published writer for 46 years. I've written over 40 books. I've done a zillion TV programs, radio shows, podcasts, live shows. I've worked at record companies as a senior exec. I've worked in management. I had my own publicity company doing some of the biggest acts in the world. I know these people. I know this world. And that's what I'm trying to convey in the books. So if I say something happened on North Clark Street, and it turns out it was the corner of sweets. OK, that's cool. Let me know. And in future editions, we'll do our best to make that right. But give me a fucking break. That's not my job. My job is to show you the soul of the universe and try and explain to you who these fucking people really are, because they ain't that picture on your wall. They really are just ordinary people. Mm. And, and Axel Rose, I feel sorry for him more than any other musician I've ever worked with. And I feel sorry for quite a few. You know, there's a lot of very sad stories in life generally, but in rock music for sure. Axel had a terrible, terrible upbringing. I, I was told stuff about him that I've never put into print, never put into a book because it's too fucking mind boggling. I mean, he's talked in interviews about being raped as a baby. He talked about his biological father. He's talked about an awful lot of stuff that is really deep. But there is another layer. And out of respect, I have not gone there. Um, so I never think of Axel as a bad guy or a crazy guy. Um, I think of him as a human being. and. The journey he's been on, uh, I think it's a real credit to him that he's able to put the band back together. You know, he is, he's an extremely difficult man to work with. But, you know, I'm a dad now, and, and, and one of my daughters is autistic. She's very high-functioning, meaning you'd never know it till you know it. But she does performing arts, stage musicals. That's the world she's training for. And she changes clothes 50 times a day. She moves to the beat of her own drummer. You know, and you can't argue with her because you are never right. But it's because her detail, her focus and attention, it's like a microscope. You're looking at it going, come on, that'll be OK. And she's like, it is not OK. And I'm not saying Axel is autistic, but he has what would probably be called some sort of personality disorder. 
but this is a very wide spectrum. And I only found out all about this through my daughter, who was diagnosed when she was about 11, and she's now nearly 19. And she's a gorgeous, beautiful girl, so talented. But what a fucking nightmare if she doesn't want to do something, you know. And um, so I went on lots of courses. My wife is a professional in the care industry. She now knows a lot about this stuff. And whatever happened to Axel to truly fuck him up, he has to live with that for his whole life. And I get it. I get it. And uh, it's not important to me whether he likes me, still thinks of me, whatever. It's absolutely not important. And the Guns N' Roses fans, God bless them. But I don't write my books for Guns N' Roses fans. I write my books for people that love to read amazing fucking books that live for stories. So when I write about Guns N' Roses or my Jimi Hendrix book, which came out in 2019, I think my best ever book, it's called Two Riders Are Approaching. Uh, my Led Zeppelin book, When Giants Walk the Earth. Mm. I am not writing it to please Jimmy Page or Hendrix's relatives. I'm not writing it for the fans that have collected everything and know everything. These days, if that's what you're into, you, there's loads of places you can have a really good time, learn the facts, day-to-day -day facts and everything, you know. That's great, but that's not what I do. And um, so it doesn't really matter to me what Guns N' Roses fans think. All I can assure you, Brandon, is that this is my life's work and I put blood and sweat and true love uh, into, can you, are you okay? You look like you're having trouble with the... Oh no, keep going. I was, you're oh, watching, okay. my, wife, my fiance just got home from her uh, friend's okay. bachelor party, which I'm, so I'm going to leave that into the episode since you were. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's good. That's good. But no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, uh, I don't, I don't, I get off, I get often asked, you know, like, um, oh, what did, uh, uh, what did Slash think of your book? Uh, what did Lars think of your Metallica book? Uh, and it's different every time. Slash is a great friend. He's always such a sweetheart whenever I meet him. He's so nice. Very supportive. Uh, all through the bad years with Axel, he was always on my side because no one was on Axel's side. And when he tried to be, he didn't, he wouldn't allow it. You know, that's why every single member got fired in the end. Mm. That's why he once said about a year or two before they reformed, he hoped that Slash got cancer. He doesn't. He probably meant it when he said it, but it doesn't mean he's a bad guy, you know. Um, What's interesting. But, yeah. yeah. But, you know, because I'm sitting here and I was so quiet. That's why I had to like, because my fiance just walked in. And I was like, I need to let her know that I'm recording because I felt like I was in class right now. Listen, <laughs> and I'll tell, <laughs> and I'll Sorry, tell you about lecturing. Oh, no, no, this was a, a a welcome class. This was good. This was a and also an, a, a good transition because I'm writing. I, I guess you can call it my first book. I have a uh, a self published one about a Cape Cod family that I did you know years ago when I was just supplementing my radio career. Probably sold like 500 copies, whatever. But uh, I'm helping write Doug Goldstein's autobiography. Oh my God. Yeah. And, you know, he is, is he back on his meds? I hope so. Well, that's a lot of the conversation. He's on his meds. I'm on my meds. You know, I think I'm on my meds. I know he, we, he talks, I mean, I don't want to give too much spoilers uh, away, but he talks about his manic behavior and how he, and, and Axel's behavior. And there's a lot, there's a really, just like with this podcast, that's why Doug and I are working well together. There's a huge mental health theme underlying all the GNR stuff. And it's interesting yeah. how you kind of phrased talking about your daughter, you know, how amazing she is and talented she is. But it's just something about that tunnel vision where you just, it's not their fault. This is just who they are. And you have to, it's, it's, and then that's how we talked about Axel and that's how he talks about himself. But I guess my transition is to Doug. 
because he's talked about, he's he's not obviously he's not the biggest fan of yours right now. I mean, can you tell me your story? I guess because he was interviewed for uh, you know one of your books and it was not the interview. I interviewed him extensively over yeah. a period of weeks and months, and I have asked Doug every time we've communicated. I have asked Doug to tell me exactly what it is he's unhappy with in the book, Last of the Giants. And Brandon, I still have the replies and God bless him. They're kind of psychotic, they're rambling. He's telling me about talking to God. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to embarrass the guy, but I realized, um, I realized he needed help. And through some mutual friends, I was I found out that actually yeah, he, he really did need help and had meds and sometimes had come off them. I've been on meds since I had my heart attack in 2005. Uh, not just for that, all kinds of shit, depression, insomnia, craziness. I'm in therapy, started that for the first time in the last year. Good. I've been in since I was um, twenty six. I've been in since I was twenty six. I'm thirty eight now. So it's, yeah, but it's the law in New York. You you got to have a therapist. That's yeah, true. That is very true. <laughs> Please, you? Oh come on! I was practically born with a therapist. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> um, so with with Doug, um, he was fantastic. And I spoke to him. I had dozens and dozens of phone calls and interviews with him. And also, but there were odd moments that kind of made me think, hmm, you know, so, hmm. He asked me once if I wanted to go into business with him on a coffee plantation in Hawaii. Sent me pictures. And, um, and I, this is, we're going back six years. So I cannot remember the numbers. So this could well, hey, apparently I'm no good with facts. Okay. So <laughs> but it was something like, you know, for just three million dollars, you know, we could be the co-owners of this coffee. Pretty sure it was a coffee plantation or something that could be turned into one or something. And I'm thinking, um, I don't have that kind of money. And I've only been to Hawaii once and I loved it. So that all sounds good, but uh, this is so kind of random and out of the blue. And then there are a couple of other things like that. And I just kind of played it straight and yeah, maybe, well, one day, you know, and then it would all get forgotten about. So I knew there was something a little off in that regard. Um, and then the book came out and he just went insane. And I spoke to him on the phone, I emailed him, and I could show you the emails, but it, it would embarrass him. And I don't wish to do that because Doug was always very, very kind to me, very open and generous. I totally got where he was coming from. He hasn't had an easy life, just like you know the rest of us. Um, I have nothing but good words to say about Doug Goldstein. I'm very, very sorry that somehow in his head he's got it that, uh, you know, I'm just this terrible asshole, this fucking guy that lied to him. I don't know about what. Okay. Let's see. Let's, um, I'll, obviously, I talk uh, to him frequently. I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, you have I your mean, own life to live. I'm not going to bombard you with this. But uh, Well, no, no, no. The thing is, the thing is, I also spent hundreds of hours talking to Alan Niven. And, you know, those two hate each other. I had, I mean, it's. Mick, it's been weird. I've become friendly with also Alan Niven. I'm not, <laughs> writing, I'm, I'm not writing his book, although uh, I got to meet him last summer when I got to uh, my fiance and I, we, we did some traveling, went to Arizona. So I got to have lunch right. with his right. wife. And, yeah. you know, when he <laughs> I didn't tell my fiance not to say anything, but no, I was kind of telling her the whole story while we're taking this GNR detour in our vacation. I'm like, yeah. Alan hates Doug, even though I'm writing the book with, with Doug. And she just says that out loud. And when Alan's face, when he found that I was writing Doug's book, I'm like, no, I love this. That's how I am with you, Mick. I have Doug's story. I just want to meet you. With Alan, I'm like, well, look. It took me months to transcribe those interviews, to transcribe <laughs> them, to go through them, 
to try and piece them together, his side of the story, his side of the story. And both of them told me extraordinary things. And in the end, though, I ended up interviewing the woman that ran the office for Alan and Doug mm. to try and get some fucking idea of balance. Right. Yeah. Um, and she pretty much told me what I expected. Um, and, and here's the thing. A lot of people, when I interview them for such long periods of time, it becomes like therapy for them. And when we stop, there's a horrible cutoff for them. And they stay in touch with me, but I'm now working on the next thing. Mm. And so I have to very gently, tactfully, just kind of withdraw. Just make the emails not this long anymore, more like <laughs> this. You know? But they yeah. still send them like this. Yeah. I tried because I knew there would be fucking trouble. Whatever I did, I knew they would kill the messenger, right? All right. So I bent over backwards to try and make sure Doug was quoted exactly as he spoke to me. I bent over backwards to make sure Alan was. And the book came out and Doug freaked out. And I tried to talk to him and the exchanges were truly, truly otherworldly, like very worrying. Not threats, but just him on a different world, you know. Alan wrote me like a hundred page letter. Of course he did. I love Alan too. I love them both. I, I, I love Alan. I love Alan, but I never read the letter because I, the book has come out. I'm already halfway through the next book. And know. whatever their gripe is, I can't fucking do anything about it now. I have You're done right. my best. You're right. You're absolutely right. And that's why, you know, the last time I spoke to to Alan through email, um, I don't know if a name you know or not, but another friend of mine, Mitch LaFon, tried to start in shit via email, um, you know, about between Doug and Alan. And then Alan's getting involved. Thing, he's just trying to make me the bad guy because Alan hates Doug and he's trying to make Alan hate me. And I called Mitch out and he's like, oh, what are you talking about? So I'm like, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with all this BS. I'm like, Alan... You know I love you. You know how I feel about you. If you have a problem with the book after it comes out, I'll help you write yours if you want. That's all I could say. Brandon, welcome to my world. <laughs> I, I was working yeah. on the Led Zeppelin book, summer 2007, um, or 2006. It was before the announcement of the O2 show. Mm. Um, probably 2006. I'd known Jimmy Page for years. Um, I'd come to him in about 2005 and said, listen, my publishers want to do, would, would love to do a book with you. Same publishers that just, I think, two or three years later put out, five years later, put out the Keith Richards autobiography, Life, which was a huge seller. Keith got a three million pound advance, like five million dollars. Um, and, and five years before, I'm coming to Jimmy and saying, these people will give you so many millions to do this. Here's what I'm thinking. We can make it like the Dylan book, Chronicles. We can make it like the Beatles anthology. You don't have to talk about underage groupies. You don't have to talk about drugs or the occult. You can talk about music. We'll make it really arty and beautiful. And um, he sat on that letter for a long time. I spoke to him and he said, put it in writing. So I sent him the letter. Um, I was told that Richard Cole, uh, their old tour manager, came round a few months later to say to Jimmy, let's do a book. I've been told I can get you 200 grand. And apparently Jimmy held up my letter and said, well, Mick Wall says he can get me at least a million. <laughs> so he, he, in his own way, it was a consideration. I gotcha. But in the end, he, he, he just wasn't getting it together. So the publisher came back to me and said, look, if Jimmy Page doesn't want to do this. That's fine. We're just going to go ahead and do a Led Zeppelin biography because these are proper literary publishers. These aren't music book publishers. These are the people that put out the Keith Richards book. Um, but these are the people that, you know, will put out Bruce Springsteen, but they'll also put out, you know, 
uh, Donald Trump, Fire and Fury, that came out with them. Right. You know, I mean, they're big, big publishers. Okay. We want to do. We want to do this book, and and um, would you like to do it? And the implication was, if I said no, they just get someone else because they were going to do it. So I went back to Jimmy. I said, this is what's happening. So here's my thought now. If you don't want to do it, cool. But if I don't do this, they're going to get someone else, someone that hasn't known you for nearly 20 years, someone that just will write the same old shit mm -hmm. as Hammer of the Gods. I'll do it. But here's the deal. You can have a back channel to me anytime. OK, you can we'll back channel. I'll try and make it how you would like to see it. That's my offer to you. And he never, he never really took me up on it. And then uh, about a year later, Saturday night, I'm at home. And I get a phone call. It's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm watching football on TV. You know, this is my time. Um, it's Jimmy. And uh, uh, it, periodically, the Zeppelin members have meetings, you know, like every three months or six months or whatever it is to talk about stuff that's come in, proposals, ideas. And an idea had come in for a theme park, a Led Zeppelin theme park in America. Would have brought in hundreds of millions. Jimmy wanted to do it, uh, I'm told. Uh, John Paul Jones, I think, was fine with it. And Robert Plant said no. Of course. And two days later, Jimmy rings me at night. He goes, you still doing your Led Zeppelin book? I went, yeah. He went, all right. I want you to promise me something. I said, yeah. He goes, I want you to say Robert Plant is a cunt. <laughs> and I went, Jimmy, I can't, unless I think he is, I can't just say that. I said, I can have you saying it. No, 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 no. I just want you to say it. And I said, uh, I said, well, I don't know if I can do that, you know, but why don't we talk about it? No, no, I know what you're trying to do. So we ended it very cordially. But the interesting thing was when I began that book, I very much began as Jimmy's guy, you know, I really felt Zeppelin should get back together and that Robert was being, you know, the party pooper. And by the time I'd finished it, uh, I was really far more sympathetic to Robert I totally got why he wouldn't want to do it because it is, it's a terrible place to go. Um, so I guess the point is, is that uh, the Metallica book, James Hetfield, when it came out, said he would never speak to me again. Lars Ulrich called me and went, hey, it's your favourite drummer. Because in the book, I basically say he can't drum, you know. Um, and we're still great friends, you know, so, so I, I don't write the books to please them. I write them to please uh, this imaginary reader who I don't want to lie to, who I don't want to bullshit. I don't care what Doug says or Alan says or Jimmy says or Robert says or whoever it is. I just try and take everything I can find and try and see what that says to me. I like and then that. Share, and then share that, uh, 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 good or bad. Right on. Uh, good or I bad. Like, I like that. So do you, I'm assuming you do the same, and tell me what the similarities and differences are between writing and telling your story than doing it on your very own podcast, the <laughs> McWall podcast. You know, well, like the, that. Has the, it been the, challenging? The, no, I, okay. I enjoy it too much. Um the Mick Wall podcast is really still developing because uh, it comes out of two previous podcasts I did. In 2018, I did one called Dead Rock Stars. Um, and that was me and another guy called Joel McIver. And each week we would pick a dead rock star and do a podcast about it. And, and Joel was a great uh, straight man. He would be the one who would, you know, bring up facts and what was their best album and all this kind of thing. Whereas I just wanted to tell the stories and that's why it became popular. There was a sort of a, um, me and Joel didn't really fit, but where we crossed over, 
was where the, 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 the interest was. We did 23 episodes of that, and then Joel positively had enough for me, and, and uh, I, I, I could see why. Um, very nice man, no clue how the real world works. And then um, 2019, I was literally touring and in America all the time. 2019 flew by, and then you know what happened in 2020. Yep. At that point, an Australian company came to me and I began doing a weekly podcast called Get Your Rocks Off. Right. And I did that with a guy called John Houghton, um, who uh, had been a young writer on Kerrang. I'd, I'd kind of been his mentor back in the late 80s. And we'd become friends and we'd done lots of work together, different things over the years. John still uh, does some work on my books in terms of research and interviews and things um a great guy very very good writer but he and i have fun we make each other laugh so um we did 36 episodes of get your rocks off the last one was in july 21 i went out on a seven week book tour after that and when i got back in september um i decided to do the mick wall podcast which is still me and john but I'm bringing other people in because John and I talk about serious stuff, but mainly we just laugh our asses off um, and, and, and just have fun with all these crazy. Like we've got a running gag about Axel um, wearing sweatpants with an elasticated waist um, because we love him. Because we love him. I mean, I say way worse things about John than that. And he says way worse things about me. I mean, it's it hurts sometimes, you know, to have the piss taken that much. But it's not just Axel. It's Coverdale. It's Ozzy. I mean, these are wonderful, wonderful characters that are a joy to do a kind of a Saturday Night Live job on them, you know, do an SNL. Yeah. Fun. Fuck it. For people that get it. I, I, you know, unless I, you're a big Axel fan, you don't get it when we talk about him walking around in sweatpants and elasticated waistband, you know, with a burger in one hand. And, you know, um, he's looking good now. He's looking good. I mean, he's not, you know, the 20 year old Axel you may remember, but he's going to be 60 this in, in yeah, a few weeks. Yeah. No, dude, listen, I get it. He looks great. He can afford to look great. I mean, if I had his money, I'd still have hair just like him. You know, but Fair I wouldn't enough. have had all the face stuff that he's had done. I don't, I don't like that. I think the people in LA that have that, they never look better. They just have that mask, you know, and he's kind of got that. But then he's a famous person. He's got to do his best to look good, you know. Yeah. Um, but the podcast, I've now bring in other voices. So um, uh, Harry Patterson, another great writer more on the serious end he came in and did a, a, a podcast with me talking about um uh rock and politics rock stars that get tied up in politics mm. good thing bad thing good examples bad examples that could be everything from roger waters to making fun of bono to to a million things it actually went way better than i thought but Harry's serious and he was really laying it down. And a lot of people really like that and asked for more. So I brought him back on. We did another one. And then we're going to do two more at the end of this month. I've got a young Irish guy doing some stuff with me on Friday. He's in his 20s. Smart guy. Um, huge Guns N' Roses fan and metal. His podcast is called That Fecking Metal Podcast. Okay. Fecking is like the Irish way of saying fucking. <laughs> sure. Um, and he's come up with an idea for maybe 10 podcasts, which are basically going to be young versus old, you know, his complete take on it and my utter bafflement um, <laughs> when it comes to what's going on now, because um, I, I don't, I don't know anything about modern contemporary rock bands or metal bands. I've got three teenage, no, my oldest daughter's 21. The other two are teenagers. And I hear a, yacht, a lot about Billie Eilish and I hear a lot about Young Blood. Have you heard of Young Blood? I've heard of him. I, I, actually, I like that one song, Fleabag. 
even though he he seems a little bit of a I don't know. He seems questionable. I mean, I think he's trying too hard to be rock and roll, but I don't know. That song Fleabag is is catchy. Dude, I dude, dude. He he is he is a modern axel. Okay. The kids love him. He's outrageous. He wears a skirt on stage, makeup. They all uh, do now, Maniskin. I mean, to me now, that's not even like a big deal. I mean, you we all grew up with it. <laughs> I mean, before me, you grew up with Bowie and Grace Jones. I mean, I had Kurt Cobain. I didn't you know? I didn't say for me. I didn't say for me. I said for my kids. Good point. Good point. Right. Okay. Right. Let me tell you something about my oldest daughter. She's 21 now. She's very musical. She can play guitar, piano, clarinet, violin. She, she finds it easy. Um, my younger daughter, the autistic one, she, she, she's a performing art. She's singing, acting, dancing. But the oldest one's a serious rock person. But when she's about 11, I heard her in her room. She had, um, what was that thing called? Guitar? Guitar Hero? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Slash she, had his own game. Yeah, I had them. She's got Slash's thing up on her in her room. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking, thinking, do I say something? And I thought, no, no, no. Why fucking spoil? Last thing you want is your dad coming in telling you about this thing you really like. <laughs> and then about six months later, because she'd obviously looked into the whole Slash thing. I'm going by her room and I can hear Sweet Child of Mine playing. Can you imagine what it's doing to my head, right? Right. So I, I, I go in and go, hi, uh, what are you listening to? She goes, it's a group called Guns N' Roses. Have you ever heard of them? <laughs> I was there when I, you know. Well, yeah, but you... you 12 year old kid you want to be like i was there you know, I don't just know. Think I... you're an asshole you know <laughs> so you yeah, fuck off I... dad you don't know anything about this you know um so that's a funny concept. You're right for a podcast. I love it. And I don't want to keep you here too long on my podcast. Obviously, we can keep going. I hope to get you back at some point. Brandon, I'll be happy to come back anytime, anytime. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Do you mind if I just ask you one more question? Hopefully sure. you can condense the story. This is uh because it ties in your last book and it was you know, it's a it's a quote that you know you almost kind of came, became famous for when you say that to Axel, you won in the last yeah. of the giants so what exactly yeah. did you mean to axel you won it's the, it's the dedication right at the front of the book for axel you won um i knew it would be misinterpreted um and i always enjoy that uh, because like i said to you earlier it's theater you know yeah. is he saying that in his war with axel axel won i've never had a war with axel and that isn't what I was saying, even though I knew pe some people would think that. I was trying to say to him, you got the band back. You got your life back. Such as it is, you know, you, you have a fiancé. Axel doesn't have anybody. Um, as I say, I can't go into it, but there are things about Axel's personal life which... Um, I've been told about by many people that I just, I just don't want to go there. Same he with Doug very, telling me, you know, it's not my place to tell either. Some it, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it, you know, I like Axel. I've always liked Axel. And um, I regret how angry I got with him. Um, you know, when he denied uh, the interview he did with me about Vince Neil. I still have recordings and people keep begging me to make them available. But I think that would hurt Axel. Um, and I, I, I'm not interested in hurting Axel or anybody. Um, he knows the truth and I know the truth. But what I was trying to say to Axel is, is look, we're both on the other side of the rainbow at this point. Mm. You know, um, you won. You're still here. You've got Slash and Duff back, which means you've pretty much got it how you always wanted it. Um, good luck. Like, you know, like say we were astronauts walking on the moon and we saw each other. Little wave. Hey, buddy. 
we got yeah. here didn't we yeah we got here despite it all here we are and um both of us need a pat on the back for that you won you won i love that i love that man and that's how i look at everything you know everything that, that's why i mentioned mental health being a theme with with me and with the band that's why the band is one of my favorites because i'm inspired by you know what he's been able to overcome and especially duff and slash and, and steven's still here and it's just amazing that izzy left a band because of his addiction i mean it's just like wow you know all these things i can relate to so much more as i keep getting older and, and mick hearing more about your story you know that's why i'm so happy to have you on and learn more about you not just from your books you talking about and telling these great stories to know more about the man mick wall so uh <laughs> it was it was a pleasure if i if i ever said anything which i don't think i ever did i might have just jumped on that you know what? I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to rehash. Uh, Brandon, uh, Brandon, it's all good. It's all good. No. We won. We won, my friend. And I hope you'll have me back. I, Of course I will. Absolutely. This was a lot of fun. You know, I told Doug the same thing with Alan. I could be friends with Doug Goldstein and Alan Niven. I could be friends with Mick Wall and well, Doug Goldstein. Well, I, 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 I am not Doug's enemy. I am Doug's friend. And I just wish him all the best. Always. Right on. So thanks for getting in the ring. All right, uh, Brandon. So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. When will you see the next one? Well, in the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, you'll see it. I don't know if soon is the word. <laughs> okay, man.